Jewish settlers say they're seeking freedom of worship, but Muslims say they're desecrating Al-Aqsa Mosque. International agreements govern the rules in the area, so why does it become a flashpoint every year? This is Inside Story. Hello and welcome to the show. I'm Sami Zaydan. Al-Aqsa Mosque compound in East Jerusalem is one of the most sacred sites in Islam. The compound is also sacred to Jews. It's been central to years of political conflict between the Israelis and Palestinians. On Sunday, hundreds of Jewish settlers and far-right activists entered the Al-Aqsa Mosque compound under the protection of Israeli forces. They were there for a day of mourning to commemorate the destruction of two ancient temples. But 15 Palestinians were injured after fighting began over Jewish settlers trying to pray at the site, something they're not allowed to do. Many Palestinians have spoken out against what they say is Israel's attempt to undermine Muslim control of the sacred site and allowing violence to escalate there. But Israel has repeatedly denied this. And several countries have condemned Israel for allowing what they call extremist Jews to visit Al-Aqsa Mosque compound. King Abdullah of Jordan denounced what he says are, quote, repeated violations and transgressions by Israel and extremist groups and their blatant attempts to change the status quo in Jerusalem. As the custodian of Islamic and Christian holy sites in Jerusalem, I will continue my efforts to protect these places and stand up against all violations of their sanctity. And the Organization of Islamic Cooperation has called on the UN Security Council to take measures to end attacks on Al-Aqsa Mosque compound. In a statement it says, Israel, quote, fuels religious conflict, extremism and instability in the region. Incursion into the and the desecration of the blessed Al-Aqsa Mosque by groups of extremist settlers under the protection of Israeli occupation forces is an act of provocation and blatant violation of relevant international resolutions. Let's find out more now about the Al-Aqsa Mosque compound. Well, the site is home to two of the most important sites in Islam. They are the Dome of the Rock Mosque and the Al-Aqsa Mosque. But it's also claimed by Jews who believe a Jewish temple once stood there. Well, in 1967, Israel occupied East Jerusalem. It later annexed the area in a decision that was not recognized by the United Nations. Jordan became custodian of all Christian and Muslim sites in Jerusalem in 1994, including the Al-Aqsa Mosque compound. Under the current arrangements, Jews pray at the Western Wall, Muslims worship within the Al-Aqsa Mosque compound. Non-Muslims are allowed to visit the mosque compound, but at certain hours are not allowed to pray there. Let's bring our guests into the show then, joining us uh, in our discussion. From London, Azam Tamimi, academic and political activist. In Jerusalem, Robbie Sable, professor of international law at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem. And also in London, joining us via Skype, Rodney Dixon, international human rights lawyer. Welcome to you all. If I could start with Robbie in Jerusalem. Uh, why do some of these settler groups feel the need to pray within the Al-Aqsa Mosque compound area? I think it's worthwhile pointing out the difference between the mosque and the area. No Jews pray in the mosque. It's a Muslim holy site. There's no argument about it whatsoever. And by the way, the same is true of the Dome of the The question is the actual compound, the open air area, which was the area of the old Jewish temple it's the area which, by the way, Jesus visited when he visited the Jewish temple. And the question is, under freedom of religion, are Jews allowed to visit it? Uh, the, some Jews want to pray there, and I think they could be entitled to under laws of religious freedom. Nevertheless, the Israeli government has taken the controversial step of refusing to allow Jews to pray even in, in the open-air compound because it, might, it would upset uh, Muslims. So we have a situation there whereby Jews want to pray there. They are not allowed to by the Israeli government. And the reason is that it would disturb uh, Islamic sustainabilities. However, they do visit it, as do Christians and every other denomination visit the compound area. Uh, 
by the way, which is controlled by the Muslim Waqf. Yeah, but my, I guess my question is, there is an area that is assigned for Jews to pray in the Western Wall. Um, why enter what you're calling the open area? Is part of the Al-Aqsa Mosque compound? There is the ablution fountain where worshippers uh, pray. There, is a, there are two mosques, as we've mentioned, a, a library and other Islamic institutions. Why the need to leave the Western Wall area and enter inside the mosque compound area and pray there? As you state correctly, the western wall is outside the area. It's a supporting wall of the old temple, built, by the way, by, uh, by Herod, the Jewish king, 2,000 years ago. The actual comp the temple was on what is now the compound. It's a large area, open air. Some of it is paved, some of it is glass. Here, Jews visit it. Some Jews want to pray. They feel they have a legal and religious right to pray. Nevertheless, the Israeli government refuses to allow them to pray. Any Jew, a Muslim can pray there, a Christian can pray there, any Jew who attempts to pray there in the compound is removed by the Israeli police. There right. is no, uh, again, it's controversial in Israel, but I think the, the Israeli government has taken a courageous and correct step in refusing to allow them to do so. All right, let's bring Azam Tamimi into the discussion. Azam, is this a matter of freedom of worship, that people who want to be able to worship sim simply should have that freedom in what Robbie is calling an open area, or is it a matter of desecration? Well, from an Islamic point of view, it is a matter of desecration. Uh, in broader terms, uh, it is a violation. Uh, it is an act of uh, aggression. And it has nothing to do with uh, Judaism or with a conflict of religions. Uh, Jewish orthodoxy bans Jews uh, from uh, praying uh, on the premises. Not only that, uh, actually, uh, original Jewish uh, 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 doctrines uh, ban Jews from settling in this area until the Messiah comes toward the end of time. Uh, what we see here is actually uh, a another invention uh, by Zionism in order to justify a colonial project. This is what it is. Uh, Israel is a colonial project that the Zionist movement, which uh, started as a secular nationalist uh, uh, movement wanted or sought to justify itself uh, in religious uh, terms uh, and therefore this has nothing to do whatsoever with worship or the right of worship uh, or uh, uh, the freedom of worship. Well, well, well I guess the question then Azam for those who who espouse this sort of claim to freedom of worship why are Muslims upset and saying it's desecration if somebody just wants to come within the Al-Aqsa, okay, given it's within the Al-Aqsa Mosque compound area, an area which has, like I said, lots of Islamic institutions, but why are Muslims calling it desecration and so upset if others simply want to come in and pray there? Well, these uh, Zionists don't come into the compound uh, as tourists or visitors. They come uh, in order to make a point, the point that they've occupied Palestine and they want to change the situation on the ground they want to uh, uh, dis uh, displace the Palestinians. This is what it is about. Uh, and, and therefore, uh, this is a question of an invasion. I've seen many mosques around the world that open their doors uh, to non-Muslim visitors who would uh, like to come and see how Muslims worship or to see uh, Islamic calligraphy or whatever, etc., or uh, in historic places to probably reflect uh, on history. But actually, the Zionists that are in Palestine today are not tourists. They are invaders. They came from Europe. They invaded us. They threw out so many Palestinians, including my own parents in 1948, uh, in order to make homes for themselves. And this battle over Al-Aqsa is simply uh, an attempt, an endeavor on their part uh, in order to seal their colonial project in the name of religion. Uh, and this is what religion is usually used uh, uh, like. And uh, as uh, Michael Pryor in his famous book, The Bible and Col Colonialism, explained, apartheid in South Africa was justified in the name of uh, uh, Christianity. Uh, the conquest of Latin America and the destruction of uh, human civilizations there and elsewhere was also justified in the name of uh, Christianity. And the Zionist invasion of Palestine is being justified in the name of Judaism. All right, let's uh, head over perhaps to Rodney. What is the legal framework for worship rights in this area? It's not a vacuum, is it? There are rules, there are international agreements that govern this.
Yes, under international human rights law, and this is the law espoused by the UN, there is, of course, the right to worship and to do that both individually and collectively, uh, and not only in, in private, but in public as well. But that's not a, an absolute right. Uh, it has to be circumscribed uh, according to the need for public safety uh, and good order. Uh, and if there are any conflicts between those, then, then it is important that a compromise is found to ensure that the rights of all can be respected. And according to the 1994 agreement between Jordan and Israel, how is this area supposed to be managed uh, between the two sides? Well, according to that agreement, which is itself law, uh, it is under the custodianship of the King of Jordan. Uh, and there's a very clear arrangement that has been put in place. That, that's the status quo. Uh, and it's important that that is maintained because it has been agreed subsequently, it has been implemented, and, and a practice has developed. Uh, and there shouldn't be any breaches of it uh, through the use of force or otherwise. Okay. Let's so come back to Robbie. Um, while those who believe that Jews should have the right not only to worship at the Western Wall, but within the uh, Al-Aqsa Mosque compound area, often cite freedom of worship as their motivation. Um, doesn't Azam have a point when he says the traditional position of, of Jewish orthodoxy over the centuries has been that Jews should specifically not worship on what they call the Temple Mount until the Messiah returns and the, the Temple is rebuilt and so on and so forth. And that has been reiterated, has it not, by people no less than Israel's Sephardi chief rabbi, Yitzhak Yosef, who uh, called on Jews to stop not only praying, attempting to pray in Temple Mount, as he put it, but also even ascending, reminding Jews that to ascend the Mount at all is prohibited according to religious text and that statement only two years ago. Absolutely correct. There are some religious authorities who say Jews should not enter it until the time of Messiah. However, other Jewish rabbis and authorities say it is permissible. This is, this is a contra are they not controversy the orthodoxy, though? within the Jewish Orthodox community. But uh, different, different members of uh, Judaism is a very pluralistic religion, like other religions, and there's a controversy within Judaism. But I don't think that is the issue. The Israeli government prohibits Jews from praying there, even though it recognizes they have a, a moral right, because, as <coughs> was said by your expert from England, it might cause unrest. Therefore, it's a, it's a public safety policy. But I'd like to make two comments. First of all, by the way, we did have an agreement with Jordan, which recognizes Jordan's historic role in the holy places when we come to reach a final status agreement. I was very upset, frankly, to hear, I think it was Azam speaking from London, I think we're beyond that stage. Israel recognizes the Palestinians' right to self-determination, and many Palestinians recognize Israel's right to self-determination. Apparently, he's not among them. We are two peoples, two living next to each other, neighbors, and we have to reach an agreement. And to hear these old polemics from 60 years ago is sad. We're beyond that now. We have a right to live in the area. The Palestinians have to live. We have to reach an agreement, and that's what we're trying to do. And I really hope we don't have bringing up these things that we're colonialists, we're not colonialists, neither are the Palestinians. We're both indigenous people living in this area. The temple there was, not, was a, Jewish era, a Jewish temple, no other temple. It was Jesus who visited the Jewish temple there, and we have to learn to live together. And I really hope we don't hear more of these, what I would call, sterile polemics. All right, let's give a chance, perhaps, to Azam to come back in on some of that. Uh, sterile polemics, polemics, you're propagating Azam. It's time to, to catch up with the times and recognize both sides have a right to be there. Your response to that? They are not so sterile when you talk about uh, a temple that existed uh, uh, allegedly uh, 3,000 years ago. But uh, when I remember how my mother uh, was uh, displaced and removed from her house in Beersheba 60 years ago, then that's uh, a sterile uh, polemic. What's, what, what sort of, uh, 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 of uh, logic is this? Uh, the Palestinians will never forget that they, their country was invaded, that uh, most of the Jews who live in Palestine today live despite us, uh, not uh, with our uh, consent. The Palestinians who uh, 
made a peace deal with Israel uh, are a minority. They are not uh, recognized or legitimized by the majority of the Palestinians. Uh, the uh, Al-Aqsa Mosque is being subjected to uh, aggression, to a violation. Uh, and by the way, this is not just a Palestinian issue. Right. Uh, Zionists uh, must uh, uh, be careful. Uh, this is a place that belongs to no, more, no less than 1.5 billion people around the world. This is an Islamic place and not just a Palestinian place. All right. Um, Rodney, while Robbie has pointed Harry, out I'll, that the Israeli Harry, government I'll has... Have... Was that, was that well, I'll, come, yes. I'll come to you in a second, Robbie. Let me just bring Rodney into the discussion. Robbie has pointed out that the Israeli government is, has emphasized and stressed it doesn't want to change the status quo. Is there something to be said, though, for organizations like Ir Armim, which are Israeli organizations which have issued reports, page 55, for example, of their report, Dangerous Liaison, talks about, quote, the state of Israel directly funds various temple movement activities. It goes on to say, in the years 2008 to 2011, the Ministry of Culture, Science and Sports and the Ministry of Education supported the Temple Institute and the Midrasha at an average rate of 412,000 Israeli shekels a year. Now, when you read things like that, that they're giving money to organizations, which openly, by the way, on their websites, call for the re-establishment or the establishment of a, of a Jewish temple in the area where Al-Aqsa Mosque now sits. Does that give some indication that the Israeli policy is not so clear-cut on, on stopping change in the status quo? Yes, uh, this has been uh, an allegation that has been made for, for some time, that there's not a consistency on the part of the government of Israel saying on, on the one hand that they will abide by the agreements, but then, then on the other supporting groupings that are, are not doing that. Uh, and there does need to be a, a rigid consistency in applying the status quo if this is to work and to remain peaceful. We shouldn't forget that what is happening now doesn't happen without a, a long history and a context within which the Security Council uh, and the General Assembly and UNESCO have both confronted Israel over their attempts to change the status of Jerusalem in various ways. And what is most important is that what is happening now should not be allowed to be a continuation of that in any form. We have to abide by the international law of the UN and these various bodies. All right, uh, let me come to Robbie. Uh, Rodney mentioned the UN Security Council resolutions, some like 476, explicitly call upon Israel to stop uh, the policy and measures, it says, affecting the character and status of the holy city of Jerusalem. Um, when you put that into context, this isn't really just a matter of a freedom of worship, is it? There, you can't take this out of the context that there is a struggle going on for the, the land. There is a struggle going on for this city itself. Some might ask, isn't it a not very wise as well as quite a provocative act to go into an area where international law has already established some regulations and there are international agreements on who can pray where to go into someone else's place of worship under armed guard and attempt to to try and start a group prayer session would be seen as provocative in any country and by any people in the world would it not i think there's a number of issues here I'm not, we're not going to somebody else's places of worship. No Jews have entered the Al-Aqsa Mosque to pray. Well, entering, sorry, sir, uh, the, the Al-Aqsa Mosque the compound, the and that mosque the, compound is, the, is under Jordanian just, custodianship, according to the 94 uh, agreement, the, and UN Security Council resolutions, it, which Rodney pointed out, no, say actually, the status shouldn't change. The, actually, the 94 agreement does not talk about custodianship. It talks about the historic rights which will be respected by Israel when we come to negotiate. And the issue is negotiate. We have reached an agreement with the Palestinians. Uh, Arafat is not a minority was not a minority member of the Palestinians. He did it on behalf of the PLO, uh, in which I'm, we agreed sorry, to negotiate. Robert, it, it does specifically with the talk about Israel the, and the Palestinians. The Jordanian Al-Qaf Ministry or, or Ministry of, of Religious Endowments having administration and custodianship, does it not? It doesn't. The 94 agreement doesn't actually specifically refer to it, but they, we have respected the Jordanian rights and 
Jordan continues to play some of the salaries of the work fair. We have no problem with that. But the, the gist of the issue is negotiate. We've agreed with the Palestinians to negotiate the status of this. We haven't, we're not, we, in the meantime, we're not changing the status of it. And when we come to negotiate it with the Palestinians, we'll have to deal with issues of freedom of access, freedom of worship, very difficult problems, but they will be solved by sitting with the Palestinians, sitting with us, but Palestinians who know that they're our neighbors, not going back to 60 years ago. By the way, my, my father-in-law was expelled from Iraq and all his property was seized from Iraq together with hundreds of thousands of Jews. That is not the issue now. The issue is now right. how do we solve the future all right. living together? And I only hope we can hear this sort of talk from the Palestinians and not going back 70 years. Right, let me bring Rodney back into the, to the discussion briefly because you did talk about international agreements and law uh, giving the Jordanian authorities administration and custodianship over this. Could you clarify that situation for us, Rodney? Yes, uh, I mean, there, there can be no doubt that that is the current position. Uh, without analysing each agreement in detail, going back to after 1967 and, and all the subsequent agreements and controversies that have arisen, the current position is that there is that custodianship being exercised and it's recognised by the parties. There can be no doubt about that. Uh, Israel is uh, uh, regarded uh, as, as having de facto control because of the occupation and, and annexation. That is the matter to, to, to be resolved. That's the wider context I was referring to. But in terms of the custodianship and the ability to ensure that there can be proper worship and in an organized and peaceful fashion, that falls back on a series of agreements and should be recognized. All right, and I think we've just got about a minute and a half to go, and I could see Azam Tamimi there uh, wanting to get in. So let me give you an opportunity before we run out of time, Azam. Well, first of all, I have two points, if you, if you don't mind. First of all, uh, as far as I'm concerned, and most of the Palestinians are concerned, the Jews who live in Palestine today are not uh, neighbors of our choice. They came uh, as invaders and imposed themselves on us. The second point, for the past 23 years, since the Oslo Accords in 1993, there have been negotiations after negotiations, and throughout that time, the Israelis have been confiscating more land, building more settlements, squeezing more Palestinians out of their homes. So the conflict over al-Masjid al-Aqsa is just the symbolism of what the, what the real conflict is about. The real conflict is about these Zionist invaders coming from abroad in order to remove us Palestinians and take our homes and our lands from us. But Azam, I guess Robbie's point was that now that there are uh, both Palestinians and Israelis uh, there in the land, isn't it time to try and find a way to work out a, a, a solution where these people can live together in peace? Well, of course, there can be a solution, and that solution will probably have to follow the example of South Africa. When the apartheid regime came to the majority of South Africans who were oppressed and told them that they were sorry for what they did to them and they wanted to live in peace with them, and they, this, uh, they, uh, they agreed to uh, pay justice back to them. And this is what the Zionists need to do. It has to begin with the Zionist acknowledgement that what they did to the Palestin Palestinians was wrong, uh, and then we can sit and talk about the future. All right, I'm afraid we are running out of time. This is a topic that we can no doubt continue to discuss, I'm sure, for many hours, not only minutes, but we'll have to leave it there for now. Let's uh, thank all of our guests, Azam Tamimi, Robbie Sable, and Rodney Dixon. And thank you, too, for watching uh, this episode of Inside Story. As always, you can see the whole show again anytime you want. All you have to do, head over to our website page. That's at aljazeera.com. And for further discussion, just head over to our Facebook page. That's all there for you at facebook.com forward slash AJ, AJ, I should say, Inside Story, where you can also join the conversation that we've got going on on Twitter. Our handle is at AJ Inside Story. From me, Sami Zaydan, and the whole team here. For now, it's goodbye and thanks for watching. <laughs>